Good morning, Chris. So far, we have learned about uh, some basic thermodynamics to understanding the underlying theory for the phase transformation. And basically, the solution of the thermodynamic gives you the information what will be the final equilibrium state. So actually, it is not ready to give you answer on how fast the system moves to the, its final destination. So it is similar to that when with the equilibrium theory, we know that our start point and the end point, but it does not give you any information. It will go this way, along this way, or along this way, or it move fast or slow. So to understand the how the system moves to its equilibrium state with a uh, certain speed, we have to know the system, the movement of system in atomic level. So the theory or the subject to handle the movement of atoms in the system is called kinetics. So because we handle the movement of, of atom in kinetics, it naturally related with the diffusion theory. Okay? So in this class and last, uh, next class, we will uh, handle the basic theory of the diffusion. So, if there is no interaction between atom, the movement of atom will depend on its random movement because it does not have any interaction with its neighbors. So, let's start with the random work of atoms. And for simplicity, let's handle this issue in one dimension. It means that <clears throat> here is the line of interest and this is origin, original point. And here, at first here is our atom and it only move can move along this line and let's assume that the jump distance of the atom is given by lambda. At, after first jump, the location of atom will be here or here, right? So after the first jump, the location of atom will be given by lambda or <coughs> minus lambda. Sorry. How can I put up this? Nope. Okay. 
after the first jump, let's, let's consider the mean position. Mean position is average position. So, but the location of lambda uh, put, uh, atom is given by minus lambda and lambda. So the mean position will be zero, right? But we are interested in how far the atom located with regardless of its sign. So let's consider the squared displacement. And mean square will be given by this one, right? Any question? No? Are you clear with the concept of mean position and mean square position, right? <clears throat> How about the second step? This atom will have a chance to move this position and also this position, right? And this atom will chance have move this position and this position. And probability to find atom is all of 104, 102, and 104, right? Again, the mean position will be zero, but square displacement given by this one and the mean square is given by this because that this is the probability to find the atom at that position. All right? Even though the probability to find the atom at origin is one of two, but the displacement is zero, right? So the contribution from this position to the mean square will be zero. So finally, we can obtain two lambda square as a mean square after the second jump. So we can tabulate the jump dis distance and the probability to find the atom at specific position. And this is the position of atom and its prob probability after five jump. And here is the probability to find out the location of the atom, and this is a distance, right? So, what will be the square distance of the atom after five jump? Here, the distance is from the left side distance, the square distance 25, and the probability is 1 of 32. And the second is 9. And the third is 1. And again, And also, and you can find that this is five on the scale. This Root mean square means that the square value of the 
mean square. And as you can see the, the previous slide, when you put the root on this one, it will give root 5 lambda. And this is root mean square after 5 jump. And how about n jump? It will give lambda root n. And what is the jump frequency? Jump frequency is the vibration frequency of the atom and the time, right? And it will be given by this word. So after 100 jump, the probability to find atom from the origin is given by this distribution. And uh, root mean square means within that distance, we can have certain probability to find the atom. And this is, as you can see, is, as you know, the similar to the standard deviation. And there will be about 68% of probability to find the location of the atom within this loop mean square distance. And from this simple calculation, you can understand when there is very high concentrated region of the atom and put in this in certain space and without any other atom, then it will gradually moves, diffuse out from its original position, right? That is the basic characteristics of the diffusion. And it is basis of the two law which describe the atomic movement, which is known as fixed first law and fixed second law. Usually when we talk about the fifth law, fifth first and or fifth second law, the atomic movement is related with the concentration. It is somewhat different from our viewpoint that the movement of atom is driven by what? In previous class, we have discussed about that the movement of atom is driven by the difference in chemical potential, right? But usually when we talk about the fixed first and second law, we usually formulate the movement of atom with the concentration gradient. That is that when we derive this kind of formulation, we naturally assume that there is no interaction between atoms. When there is no interaction between atom, the the way to reduce its chemical potential is exactly the same to the way to reduce its concentration. Okay, let's start with the fixed first law. When we talk about the fixed first law, we have to remember, we have to uh, bear in mind that the formulation of fixed first law is uh, give you the atomic flux, flux of the atom in the given constant concentration gradient. This concentration gradient is not dependent on time. The fixed first law give you the atomic flux under the constant atomic uh, gradient. So let's, for the simplicity, let's consider the, this simple cubic atom. And we, fo we, are, we are focused on this uh, solid black atom. And let's see that in this plane, 
the concentration of atom is given by C. And in this plane, 2, the concentration is C plus delta C. Naturally, the concentration gradient is given by this linear line. If the, the gradient is not linear, for example, this one or this one, it naturally gives you that the concentration gradient depends on time. The only way the concentration gradient become independent, independent of time is that it should be linear, linear shape. So, assuming the random jump, let's consider the flux of atom from plane one to plane, plane two. This one. Here, the flux J is given by 1 over 6 nu C lambda. 1 over 6 nu is that we, if, uh, because we consider the atom movement in simple cubic system, there is six direction of the way, six direction of way of atomic movement. So 1 over 6 comes from that one. And lambda uh, nu is the effective jump frequency. So this product, 1 of 6 nu, give you the effective jump frequency from plane 1 to plane 2. Right? And C lambda, because that the planar distance between plane 1 and 2 is lambda, C lambda give you the number of atom in this plane, number of atom in this plane, number of atom of this black atom, number of this black atom in this plane. So the product of the effective jump frequency along x direction and the number of atom in that plane give you the flux, atomic flux from the plane A to plane B. In the same way, you can calculate the flux of this black atom from plane to plane one with similar way. And you have to remember that the concentration is given by this C plus delta C because we assume that the concentration gradient of this atom in plane two is given by this one. And the net flux of atom from plane one to plane two, which have this concentration gradient, will be the difference of this J1 and this J2, right? So then you can finally obtain this equation and put this one as a diffusivity of the atom B, then you can find, obtain this fixed fix first law flux is linear relationship with the concentration gradient. If the concentration gradient is, uh, has a linear shape, there is no problem because it does not change. It. The, the shape does not, the shape of the concentration gradient does not change with time. But let's think about this kind of concentration gradient in this tube cell material. 
According to the fixed first law, the flux of atom is linearly dependent on its gradient. So let's consider the gradient in plane one and plane two. As you can see, the gradient, concentration gradient in plane one is steeper than plane two, right? What does it mean? It means the flux in through a plane one is larger than the flux out through the plane two. And it naturally suggests the diffusion matter will accumulate within this volume, right? It is natural, right? When we, you put more atom to certain volume, then the atom will leave the volume, then number of atom in the volume will increase. When the number of atom in the volume increase, it naturally affects the concentration gradient, right? So now we have the system which, of which concentration gradient varies with time. The fixed flux, uh, the, the fixed second law will give how to handle, you will give you, you a way how to handle this situation. Uh, to describe the change in the concentration profile, let's consider the atomic flux in this volume for very short time, delta T. When you consider the difference between flux in and flux out, and the product with this value with delta T will give how much diffusion matter accumulate or decrease for given time delta T, right? So it should be balanced with the increase or decrease of solute in volume of delta x for given time delta t. So this is a kind of mass balance equation, right? Everyone agree with it? So let's calculate the flux in and flux out using the fixed first law. And the fixed first law tell you the flux in at position one is given by this one. And the flux two in position two is given by this one. Then with some mathematical treatment, we can convert the concentration gradient in position two with the combination of the concentration gradient in position one. How we can do this, convert this one to this one.
What is this? This is tail expansion, right? What is the physical meaning of the tail expansion? Well, you may learn the tail expansion in the first the freshman's mathematics class, right? The meaning of tail expansion, physical meaning, is that you can convert any function which is which is able to differentiate it, to be differentiated, it can convert with linear form, linear polynomial form. Right? For example, this this is our function f. Right? So here is a, some interesting point. Then with some first, second, and higher order derivatives, you can represent this function with linear combination of polynomial. Right? So if you use this one, you can convert the concentration gradient in point two with the concentration gradient in point one. So let's let's see that fx is partial x over partial c. Then we can expand this concentration concentration gradient at point x equal x one. Then x equal x one. Like that. So usually, one, two, or three term is enough to represent the original function with the tail expansion. So we abandon the remains. So you can easily see that this is delta 1, delta x. Right? So with the aid of tail expansion, you can convert this term into this one. Any question? No. So finally, if you put this value and this value in this flux balance equation, you can finally obtain <coughs> this form of fixed second law. Right? So this fixed second law has a form of differential equation. And as you know from the class of the engineering mathematics or the class in the differential equation, you can solve this equation with some initial condition and boundary condition. For example, when we consider the initial concentration of some component in this data function, 
And with this initial condition and this with boundary condition, we can solve this differential equation and have this solution. And this solution will give you the propagation of the solute atom with time. One thing I would like to mention is that solving the equation is not a big deal. There are many tools which you can use or you can get some uh, result. The problem is how to define the real problem is how to define the problem itself. In many cases, students confuse the phenomena and the problem. Phenomena is quite well, perfectly separated things with the problem in many cases. For example, you have a kind of material which is not good at toughness because of the brittle pressure. The brittle pressure it itself is a phenomenon. Brittle pressure itself is not a problem. So you have focused on what kind of mechanism or what kind of things govern that phenomena. And you can consider how we can formulate that things into mathematical form. That is the most important thing during your research work. And if you have proper form of problem, then I think that the half of work is done. So for the student, in particular, the, the, uh, the student who has a material science engineering background, they are particularly has some uh, inherited fear, inherited fear on the equation, formulation. But important thing is not to solve the equation. Understanding the basic physical meaning and constructing the formulation itself is far more important thing. You, you will realize what I mean during your research work. Okay. There are some difference, basic difference in considering the diffusion of the interstitial and substitutional atom. What is the basic difference? Interstitial and substitutional element. There is big difference. Mm -hmm. Right. It is related to the position of the atom. As you can see, when we consider the interstitial atom, the surrounding of interstitial atom is filled with vacant place. So it can jump whenever he wants. But substitutional element, the jump is not that easy to compare with the interstitial atom because it can jump its neighbor site only if its neighboring site is a, has a vacancy. If there is no vacancy around him, there is no way for the substitutional atom to diffuse. 
that is one of the reasons why the diffusivity of the substitution atom is far less than the interstitial atom. And the difference be between these two uh, interstitial and substitutional atom is the diffusivity is around 10 to 4 and 10 to 6. Before the suggestion of the vacancy mechanism for the substitution element, other mechanism is suggested. For example, this interchange of these two atoms or link mechanism, which uh, describe the movement of uh, substitution element as this kind of circulated movement. But When the Kirkendall shows this experimental result, the vacancy mechanism of the diffusion of the substitution alloy element become clear. Let's consider this. This is the Diffusion. This is called diffusion couple, and it is a joint of these two bar. At first, this bar is consists of atom A, and this bar is consists of atom B, and joint and heated up in high temperature. Then, due to the concentration gradient. The atom B will diffuse from to into A side, and atom A will diffuse into B side. And after some time at high temperature, we will we can observe this kind of concentration profile. What Kirkendall observed is that when the This is B and this is A. B and A. When the diffusivity of atom A is faster than atom B, what will happen? The flux of atom A to B side is higher than the flux of atom B. B into A side, right? Then what cause? What does it cause? If the flux of A atom is higher than the flux of B atom, to compensate the difference between the difference of atomic flux between two atoms, there is a net flux of vacancy. Right? So if A atom flux like this and B atom flux like this, and there is a there should be additional flux of the vacancy. So at first, if we put some markers on the interface of these two bar, because of this net flux of vacancy, the marker will move to the side of high diffusivity element, right? So this movement of marker definitely shows that the vacancy plays a role, very important role in diffusion of the substitution element. Okay. 
Now let's talk about the temperature dependence of the diffusivity. The number of jump of the atom for the diffusion will be the product of the intrinsic frequency intrinsic vibration frequency of atom and the probability that kind of freak, uh, vibration is linked to the successful jump. And the probability of successful jump is related with the energy barrier, which is related to the migration of atom and the less uh, lattice distortion accompanying to the migration of atom. So this is the intrinsic frequency of the movement of atom. And if we separate the free energy barrier with the entropy and entropy term, then this term will be independent of time, and this term will be dependent of time. And because in previous slide, we already know that diffusivity is linearly related with the uh, vibration. So finally, we can write down then the diffusivity is temperature dependent with this form. And when you look at the diffusivity handbook, all the diffusivity handbook give you this coefficient and activation energy, which permit you to calculate the diffusivity of atom in any temperatures. How about the substitutional diffusion? This, this also has a similar form and the intrinsic, intrinsic vibration frequency and uh, activation energy, but there is another one. This is the concentration of vacancy. As I told you, for the interstitial atom, its neighboring site is, can be regarded as a vacancy site, but not for the substitutional element. So the successful jump probability should have should be affected by the probability to find the vacancy as its neighbor, right? And as you can see here, the equilibrium concentration Frequency is given by this form. As so here, delta G V is the free energy change to create one more of frequency into the system. Here, why we can write down this one and let's consider. When you, when, you, when you create one more vacancy into the system, then the free energy change is given by this one, and this can be divided into entropy and entropy change, right? So when you put this vacancy into the system, How much of free energy 
of the system will change. When you put this fraction of the frequency into the system, how much of the free energy of the system will be affected? This will be given by V, H, V, D, delta S, V, and the only thing is here. And there is Right, the concentra uh, the contribution from the configuration. Okay. So, when we consider the free energy of the system with one more, it will. Have uh, this form. So when we consider the equilibrium value, this is At equilibrium, this value should be zero, right? <clears throat> okay. And from this one, you can evaluate the equilibrium concentration of the vacancy, like this form. Okay. So as you can see, that the, the diffusivity of the uh, substitution order element is uh, one of the function of the uh, vacancy concentration, and the in meta in many metals, the equilibrium concentration of the vacancy is close closely related with the melting temperatures of the material because to create the vacancy into the system, you have cut the atomic bond, and when the material has higher te uh, melting temperatures, it means it has a higher bonding energy. So that's why when we plot when we plot the self diffusivity sub is means that the diffusivity of, for example, iron atom in iron matrix, the silver atom in the silver matrix. So when you consider the diffusivity of many metals, you can see that it is similar to the order of the melting temperatures of that material. So you can see that tungsten is the most high, uh, the highest te melting temperature in me among metals. So the diffusivity, self diffusivity of the tungsten is very low compared to other materials. 
Okay, uh, this is what I prepared today. So any question? No? Okay, then see you in Thursday. <laughs>